Hello, everybody. So my name is Andrei Turinsky. I'm also from SickKids, as uh, some of the presenters from yesterday. And uh, we will continue with the topic of epigenetics in this session as well. So the learning objectives is I'll try to hammer again the idea that epigenetic, epigenetics is very important, uh, in addition to genetics. We will then do the practical, where we will explore some of the uh, DNA methylation data sets. We'll try to classify uh, new samples, see which ones could be classified as pathogenic or benign, and how to visualize the results of that. So let's start with this topic. Um, so I have to say that epigenetics has been exploding in the last, I would say, about 15 years, uh, even in uh, popular imagination. So people who are far removed from biology or genetics or bioinformatics are realizing that, well, as the Time magazine cover from 2010 says, uh, DNA isn't your destiny. So not everything is packed into your uh, just genome itself, uh, as people understand it, the double helix with the uh, nucleic acids. Because if you think about it, uh, my body, for example, has cells that are almost, well, virtually identical genetically. But obviously my brain cells are different from my liver cells, are different from my blood cells, and so on and so on. And the same thing happens across diseases. And uh, on the right side of the slide, you see uh, uh, two mice. They are genetically identical, but they obviously look very different. And that's due to just one gene and one promoter of that gene, a Huti gene that controls, well, various things, but also uh, the uh, hair color, the diabetes predisposition, some of the uh, cancers that are more prevalent in the yellow mice compared to the brown mice. And again, this is identically genetic, uh, genetically identical mice. Now, uh, there's this uh, common theme that DNA loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger, so people can have, you know, the same genome, and depending on their lifestyle, things can go horribly wrong. Um, now, epigenetic provides the actual mechanism for that in many cases. So the way that actually occurs is through epigenetic mechanisms that impact how the body develops and how the phenotypes come about. Now, when we say epigenetics, people mean different things. Uh, so for some people, epigenetics is all about DNA methylation. So I will try to point my mouse now. Uh, maybe not so easy. Here, right. So you can have your DNA little metal groups, and they would uh, be attached to your you know, DNA cytosines, and that will impact translation because some of the cytosines may like physically block the uh, transcriptional uh, mechanisms. Now for some other people, uh, epigenetics is all about histone marks. So there are all kinds of histone marks and you, you saw the ENCODE project before that. It's mostly about cheap seek experiments and a lot of that is uh, histone marks of all kinds. There is uh, histone Methylation, dimethylation, trimethylation, acetylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitylation, and uh, all kinds of things. And uh, histones are the proteins that make up the nucleosomes, and uh, their little tails could be marked with various chemical tags. Uh, for other people, epigenetics is about uh, nucleosome positioning. Uh, nucleosomes are positioned dynamically, so they can you know, move around a little bit. Uh, and uh, bigger and newer studies are studying uh, more general and higher level looping of uh, DNA, so DNA confirmation studies. They would look for big blocks where the DNA come in contact with each other and, you know, uh, linearly very distant uh, pieces of DNA may have major impact upon each other because in three dimensions they loop and they become very close. Now, uh, in DNA studies, in genetic studies, the ones we talked about yesterday, the mechanics of it is more or less uh, understood in the sense that you can have a genomic variant that could like physically stop the protein. You know, you can have a nonsense mutation, the protein is too short, and you know, disease follows. Uh, or there could be a SNP that affects uh, some, you know, the, uh, some gene down the line, and you can have, uh, you know, linkage disequilibrium, and studies like that, you know, have, uh, have their own mechanism. 
Now, in epigenetic, the mechanism is slightly different, but uh, the theme of it could be similar. You can have uh, some exposure on a promoter of a gene, for example, and the gene promoter could be heavily methylated, and that stops the transcriptional machinery physically from, you know, coming into contact and do, doing the transcription. So the gene could be silenced that way. Or the opposite case, you can have uh, low methylation, and so the transcription machinery activates and the gene gets uh, transcribed. Uh, now, environment affects those outcomes as well. So environmental agents can act uh, either on uh, the uh, proteins that actually change the methylation or some other marks, or on the modulatory proteins that then in turn, you know, cascade into uh, changing other proteins and so on. So there could be quite complicated uh, epigenetic machinery from environment down the line all the way to the transcriptional, etc., to the phenotype. And uh, transcription could be affected by both genetic and epigenetic components. So you can very well have a SNP that affects uh, the methylation. And that is actually one of the good filters for looking for significance of SNPs. Uh, some SNP may not be obviously related to the mechanics of a gene that is uh, at fault, but it acts through an intermediate layer of methylation. So the SNP can affect the methylation of a certain promoter, or could be distant enhancer, and then that enhancer in, uh, in turn either activates or somehow represses the transcription of the gene. And again, environment comes into effect as well, so you can have the same promoter acted upon from a SNP and also from environmental agents. So altogether, I have to say that uh, methylation is complicated, uh, epigenetics is complicated. Uh, histone marks are very complicated. There are lots of them, and they all do their, uh, various things. So, not to say that genetics is simple, but epigenetics is more complex. It has more data types, it has more agents acting upon each other, and it's not uh, entirely understood yet, So, which is why we are working on it. Um, now, uh, in terms of diseases, some diseases, famously cancer, are very much epigenetically driven, not at the initial stages. So you can have driver mutations that initiate cancers, but the progress of cancer, apparently, in many cases, is epigenetically driven. So you can have driver mutations to initiate the cancer, but uh, cancer kills typically through metastatic progression, right? So like once you had, uh, you, you, you're at the stage where there are metastases, uh, that's where things become very, very bad for the patient. And the uh, development of metastatic cancer is primarily through epigenetic, uh, uh, well, it's not mutations necessarily, but some kind of variability. So things are going horribly wrong on the epigenetic stages of things, even though you may not find the mutations that are responsible for progressing from, you know, stage three to stage four. Um, now, the same thing applies to diseases that have very strong uh, environmental component, such as autoimmune diseases, various allergies, also metabolic diseases. Uh, uh, you can think of diabetes, you can think of other problems, uh, body mass indices, that's, and so on. So if you're thinking of a disease that has especially environmental component or it's a kind of cancer, think about epigenetics. It's, uh, you know, it should be impressed upon you that epigenetics plays a major role, especially in some of these diseases and especially the later stages of them. Now, uh, it uh, could also affect diseases such as neurodegenerative diseases and neurodevelopmental diseases. Uh, now, here is a paper that describes Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Huntington and uh, other, uh, uh, other sclerosis. Um, obviously, there are physical manifestations, but also if you're looking at uh, Epigenetic studies, they would tell you that there is modified DNA methylation, there is modified uh, agents that act upon DNA through epigenetic mechanisms, such as uh, methyltransferases in uh, the case of sclerosis in the last one. Uh, so there is a complicated machinery usually acting upon different aspects of the metallome, and the changes could be either major or subtle. Uh, in cancer, usually changes are very major, in uh, neurodevelopmental diseases like autism, uh, the differences in methylation could be minor and uh, harder to find, and also diseases themselves could be quite heterogeneous. 
because different um, different genes act upon similar pathways, and so the mutations may come from different kinds of genes. So in autism, there would be uh, over 100 genes acting upon this disease, but ultimately they all somehow end up through some kind of funnel effect to result in a various degrees of, of autism spectrum disorder. Now, uh, that said, I will progress to DNA methylation. Now, why methylation? Uh, for several reasons. Now, uh, number one, methylation of DNA is a very stable mark. You can actually keep the same sample for, uh, you know, decades and, you know, in a frozen state. And methylation is preserved, DNA methylation. You can study it much later and compare cohorts and so on and so forth. Now, there are also uh, sort of logistical reasons behind it. So, there's a company, Lumina, which has created wonderful microarrays. Uh, cheap enough, and they can scan almost, well, the full genome. So you can have genome-wide methylation study of your patient cohort for cheap, something around $400, something like that, um, uh, per, per sample, of course. So here is a uh, snapshot of gene ontology, uh, sorry, uh, gene expression omnibus uh, resource from a couple of weeks ago. And these are the famous 450K methylation arrays. So the reason they're called 450K is they have roughly 450,000 probes. Actually, more than that, it's 488,000. Um, they uh, became vastly popular. And as you see, there's a, well, let me point with my mouse right here. So there's an over 1,000 studies using these particular arrays of all sorts of diseases. So you can see various kinds of cancers. There's uh, esophagus cancer carcinoma here. And there are interesting things like uh, humanized mice. Even that, you know, is scanned on the same microarray. And I've seen primates and gorillas scanned on a human uh, DNA methylation array. But for the most part, I mean, here I chose uh, Homo sapiens as the species. And, you know, all sorts of diseases could be scanned on these arrays, and they are. Uh, number of samples also vary quite dramatically. So some studies would show you, you know, six or two, or is it nine or five? I can also see from here. So just very few samples. And some studies are into hundreds <coughs> or potentially even thousands of samples. So you can have a lot of samples scanned on the same technology. It's uh, widely available. It's comparable across studies. There are, uh, you know, protocols that make things easy enough to compare to each other. And so people have been using these arrays quite extensively. There was a previous array, 27K, which was small. Mostly, uh, mostly the probes were in the promoter regions. But ever since the 450 array came out, uh, came out it became very, very popular. Now, in the last few years, it's been superseded by the next big thing. It's an epic array. It's uh, double the size, 850 probes or so. The uh, labs are switching to epic. Uh, now, the number of studies already published is not so great yet. So currently, as I looked at it a couple of weeks ago when I made the slides, uh, it was only 49 samples available uh, at the Gene Expression Omnibus, 49 studies. Now, uh, of course, they will come out because it will take, you know, it will take people a year or two or three to actually publish the study if it's a big one. But, uh, you know, not there yet, but growing. And the good thing about the EPIC and the 450 is they overlap to a very large extent. So most of the probe, over 90% of the probes that were available on the 450 platform are also available on the EPIC platform. So in principle, they are very much comparable, and studies done on 450 could be uh, easily enough checked on the EPIC, and vice versa. So you can reduce your EPIC array to the previous 450 if you want to compare the study done on EPIC to a previous study done on the 450 array. So this is same company, same technology behind it, and uh, large overlap between the two types of probes. Uh, now, for all sorts of reasons which we can list, people are also doing sequencing studies. So uh, here is a list of whole genome bisulfide sequencing. So of course, there are multiple advantages of doing sequencing. Uh, well, you have a much wider coverage. You're not uh, stuck with only the 850,000 probes that Illumina defines for you. You can 
or potentially have millions and millions of cytosines scanned for their methylation um, uh, status. Um, useful for single cell studies, useful for all kinds of things. Uh, of course, more complicated in terms of coverage. You have to worry about uh, whether your cytosine in this one sample is well covered. If you have 100 samples, you want to know whether that cytosine is covered at all of them well, whether you have, you know, 10 reads or 30 reads or 50 reads available for your one cytosine across the spectrum of your samples. So if you are trying to overlap those things, it could be, uh, you know, the number of cytosines would go from millions to perhaps, you know, hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands, depending on your coverage across the spectrum, uh, which is why people switch to uh, regions and analysis of regions. Now, uh, as uh, Guillaume was showing you, the IHAC consortium is compiling uh, primarily sequencing-based studies. So there is whole genome by sulfide sequencing. Let me point my mouse to it here. So WGB-seq, that is the uh, by sulfide sequencing component of DNA methylation. Um, so resources are available. Now, um, different technologies, of course, require different methodologies. And 450 array has been very popular, and there is a whole spectrum of uh, pipelines and tools available to study it. So here's a paper from 2015 that lists the top five, and they're still fairly popular. So uh, the uh, pipelines uh, are uh, in Bioconductor, in R. Uh, so those are the famous ones, such as MINFI, such as R and Beads. And this is, if you see the color as well, MINFI, which is the kind of light brownish one, is uh, available for all steps of your pipelines, almost up to interpretation. So the only thing they're missing is they don't do the copy number vari uh, variation analysis. And of course, no uh, pipeline would do, would do biological interpretation for you. That's why, uh, that's why we would no never be replaced by artificial intelligence, for example. So, you know, artificial intelligence could do everything up to the interpretation, perhaps. Um, so same thing for some of these other pipelines. The R and beads would probably do most of your steps up to the interpretation on perhaps copy number variation. Some other pipelines are more specific to pre-processing and uh, they leave the, uh, the juicy parts for other pipelines or for analysis that, uh, that is done manually or through some other considerations. So I have to say that the thing people look for uh, in most cases are these two, calculation of differential methylated positions and identification of differential methylated regions. So though, uh, that is the juice of the analysis. Those are the pieces uh, which will tell you which genes or which promoters or which enhancers are responsible for your differences between, well, let me say, cancer cohort versus controls or disease versus uh, unaffected siblings or something like that. So the uh, essential outcome of the pipelines typically comes as a listing of your differentially methylated patterns of some kind or another. So for arrays, uh, it's typical to report positions and then maybe regions. For sequencing studies, the uh, regions are more essential because, uh, first of all, you have enough cytosines to, uh, to merge into regions. And secondly, coverage issues may, uh, may be an obstacle for specific cytosines, but they will be, uh, you know, you will have enough coverage for a region. Uh, for a tiling window, for example. So the analysis across regions and tiling windows becomes more of a driving, uh, sort of driving force behind all these uh, differential methylated patterns. All right, so as we go into data representations, what do we see, essentially? So we try to think, uh, regardless of whether it's an array study, microarray study, or a sequencing study, uh, we try to think of a table uh, so in a typical table, you would have your subjects or samples or tissues as your columns and your genes or probes or cytosines <coughs> as your rows. And uh, to the dismay of many data analysts, uh, the number of features, which is to say probes, is vastly, vastly larger than the number of subjects that you're working with. So the number of data samples is small, the number of features is very huge, so you have to somehow you know, reduce your dimensionality and work with the highly, highly dimensional spaces and try to 
make sense of them in the lower dimensions as you go. Um, so based on this uh, mock table, your two genes, X and Y, would define a space, X and Y, and depending on what methylation or uh, some other measure you have, uh, you would position your samples accordingly and then try to see what patterns exist across the samples. Okay, so typical questions that come up is uh, the following. Uh, are you doing a supervised analysis or unsupervised analysis? So in a, again, in a mock study, uh, unsupervised would be the one where you are trying to find out the groupings among your samples. So perhaps you have one kind of cohort or you're not quite sure which labels uh, are applied to which sample, so you're just looking for some clustering. And, you know, in this case you'd see two clusters and you're happy with them until you discover more data, in which case you see that, yes, first of all, your clusters were not ideally positioned, you'll have to rethink about the boundaries and, you know, recalculate them, and perhaps there's a new cluster atop uh, which was not evident initially because you just didn't have enough data. So there's a new cluster of, of samples there. In the unsupervised uh, scenario, that is all you can do, so you're looking for grouping. In a supervised scenario, you actually have labels. So you would be asking questions of, here's my disease sample, uh, let me point to it at the bottom here, and there are my two controls or two normal samples, where is my decision boundary? So the essential question you want to ask is, well, how do I decide for a new sample whether it's normal or disease? Where, you know, if you place your new sample somewhere here, uh, how do you decide whether it's closer to normal or closer to disease, and therefore what is the classification for your new cases? And again, same issues apply. If you collect more data, you might discover that, uh, you know, you were previously missing two of the disease uh, uh, samples like that, so they define perhaps another group of the disease, it could be a heterogeneous disease, so your decision boundary can become more complex than you thought initially, or you have to redraw it uh, through some other way, depending on which, the, which model you're actually using for the classification. Right? So typically this will be an uh, example of unsupervised classification. Uh, uh, right, so uh, This is another approach which everybody loves, principal component analysis. Everybody knows what it is, right? Raise your hand if you don't, or if you have used it. You used it, yeah? Okay. So you're looking for the largest variation between your groups or just generally within your data set. Um, this is an example. This is actually a figure from a study we published in uh, 2013. So very nice to draw a decision boundary between two uh, clouds like this. You have your diseases in red on the... Oops. Uh, on the left side, there was a here. So on the left side, you have a bunch of diseases shown in red. On your right side, you have a bunch of controls shown in green. So amazingly easy to say that you know there's a clear boundary in the first principal component where you know things on the left are diseased, things on the right are controlled. Now, this you know the big secret. This was done after the uh, coordinate space was prepared in a special way. So we first extracted. Uh, only the most discriminating or the most telling, the most predictive probes. So we spent some time finding those differentially methylated probes. And then in the space defined by those probes, uh, of which there were 53 down from whatever array that was, that was actually a 27k array. So from 27,000 uh, dimension, uh, dimensions, you went down to 53 dimensions in which you see this pattern fairly clearly, and now you can draw the decision boundary between them, and so on. So, uh, initial data set was something like this. So this is based on the entire array, it was 27k array. Uh, promising, but not as great, right? You could see clearly that there's a difference between the first principal component uh, diseases and control. So, you know, diseases uh, tend to be on the left, controls tend to be on the right, but the separation is not as clear and there are some borderline cases, uh, so you have to spend a little bit more time to actually find uh, very good separations on which we can build, uh, you know, classification models or use it downstream in some other analyses. All right, and there are some tools that do, well, almost entirely this. So there is this, uh, for example, Glucor Omic Explorer tool, which you can get for yourself at glucor.com, and what they do is this is a 
uh, differentially methylated signature slash principal component analysis tool. So all they do is they take, well, I don't want to minimize what they do, of course, they have lots and lots of options and very useful tool, but uh, the essential pipeline of how they're thinking about analysis is take a data set, find differentially uh, methylated regions, and as you keep uh, shrinking them or making them more stringent, your PCA becomes more and more apparent. So you start with a cloud that is not very well separ separated, but then as you find differentially methylated positions, your uh, whatever yellow, uh, red, and orange or blue points will start separating into proper clouds. Uh, so, you know, useful tool. People will love to use it. Now, there are more complicated analyses. So this is a paper that came out just uh, in March in Nature. Uh, they threw together not PCA, but something slightly more complex, uh, TISNI, it's a, a stochastic neighbor embedding tool, but again, it's a different uh, dimensionality reduction tool. Uh, 91 types of brain cancers all thrown together. Uh, the picture looks something like this, and you can now define your different clusters, and then based on these clusters, you can build your special models and then use them for classification. So a good paper. Similar theme. Now, we tried, uh, of course, dif uh, differential methylation uh, patterns in all kinds of scenarios. Uh, this is another paper we published in Nature Communications uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, where you can show patterns of differential methylation by you know, standard methods, hierarchical clustering. So again, you shrink your space from 450,000 probes down to, in this case, 7,000 probes or so. And in that newly defined space where things are nicely separable, yes, your diseases, in this case, uh, uh, this was Soto's syndrome, one of the neurodevelopmental diseases, are very nicely separated from controls. So not all probes define good separation, but these ones, the ones we chose, do. And that was easy to see, and clearly there is a pattern there. Uh, now, the problem with hierarchical clustering, uh, it's a wonderful tool, everybody loves using it, but if you add new cohorts, uh, the clustering will change, right? So like even if you add one new point to your clustering, your uh, dendrogram may actually change its position. So here we try to do, uh, like I'm even ashamed to call this machine learning, it's, that's, it's too simple for that, but you know, it's some kind of decision boundary. So what we try to say is the following, we look at our uh, disease cohort, we look at our controls, we define two profiles, and then for every new case, whether it's a control or disease or a similar disease or unknown samples, we try to see which, uh, whether it's closer to disease or control. That's it. So uh, we, define, oops, we define some kind of correlation uh, metric, and we say that you know, for every new point, we place it whether uh, it's closer to the uh, disease profile, so it will be higher on the upper triangle, of, you know, on the, on the diagonal plot here, or if it's closer to the control profile, then it will be on the lower triangle of the, this diagonal plot. And it turns out that uh, if you take, you know, th over a thousand controls from the gene expression omnibus, throw them on this plot, all of them very, very nicely would go and cluster here, so you have a giant cloud of controls, all of them properly classified. But if you throw some other uh, cases or similar, uh, you know, clinically similar syndromes, uh, some of them will go to the proper position. So like uh, Weber syndrome in orange, it was clinically similar and it was all classified as control. So we can, you know, we can molecularly distinguish the two uh, diseases. But if you have some unknown cases uh, or uh, missense mutations, it depends. So here you would have this causative genes, the one for nonsense mutations of which causes the disease, but missense mutation is unclear, and some missenses will go and cluster with the disease cases, and some missenses will cluster with control cases, and so you should be able to then tell which missense mutation is pathogenic or benign, just using this tool, uh, in addition, of course, to some other predictive mechanisms. Now, uh, you know, all the cool kids now do machine learning and artificial intelligence, and like, we are not averse to that. Um, so we, uh, we published uh, another study recently. So we looked at two different clinically overlapping syndromes. This is CHARGE syndrome and Kabuki syndrome. Uh, they, uh, 
they result in clinically similar but still different phenotypes. So there is facial abnormation, there is uh, intellectual disability, but the problem is uh, sometimes it's hard to tell apart, especially for younger children. Now, the uh, molecular uh, genetic side of things is very different. So in charge, uh, this is uh, primarily from the CHD7 gene. In Kabuki, it's from two genes, primarily KMT2D, but also KDM6A. So KMT2D is histone metal transferase gene, and the other one is histone demetallase gene. So all of them are some kind of histone modifying genes, uh, but they are different genes. So, you know, met, uh, the, the actual genetic mutations are quite different, but uh, apparently they end up working on the same pathways and the same chromatin modifying machinery, which is why you have papers like this. This was a previously uh, published paper, 2014. So they say things like, we report a patient that was initially diagnosed as charged, but that eventually it, uh, it turned out that it was a Kabuki case. And they say that, well, uh, you know, these two causative genes apparently uh, work on the same machinery, which is why, you know, it was hard to do it initially. So what we um, ended up doing is we uh, developed a DNA methylation-based predictive system. So in this case, we did, you know, uh, support vector machines and we tried random forest and, you know, a few things was, uh, was uh, tried here. And uh, basically, we built... Well, two classifiers, if you think about it. So we can assign a score for your charge syndrome, a score for your Kabuki syndrome, based on DNA metalomes alone and nothing else. And, uh, well, the good thing is they were all classified correctly by themselves and also some of the replication cohorts and validation cohorts. And nothing was classified here in the upper right side, which means no cases or controls or any samples of unknown significance were classified highly as both diseases, which means there was no ambiguity. So uh, even though doctors may have trouble distinguishing the phenotypical manifestations of these clinically overlapping diseases, especially in small children uh, under three, where things are not quite developed yet, where you can specifically like, clearly tell, yes, it's Kabuki or it's charge. On the molecular side of things, on the DNA side of things, uh, the uh, mechanics of it are quite different, and we were able to build models that are not ambiguous and uh, distinguish those the diseases early enough. So that was good. And uh, uh, we also threw uh, like all kinds of GEO controls, hundreds and hundreds from uh, publicly available data sets, and they were all classified as controls, so you know, things were properly validated in that sense. And we're all, uh, also able to say things like, well, uh, for a gene here, like it's a uh, HOXA5, uh, your background methylation level across a region, uh, this is a promoter region, as you see, so HOXA5 goes that way. So the background level is in green, and both genes are uh, gaining methylation there. So the HOXA5, sorry, not both genes, in both syndromes, HOXA5 in charge syndrome has higher methylation level, shown here in red, and also in, uh, in Kabuki syndrome, it's a higher methylation level, shown in blue, which is why perhaps these genes are, sorry, these two syndromes are acting and showing similar phenotypes because they affect g uh, genes like HOXA5 in a similar fashion. But also there are genes like, uh, which one is it, Slytric 5, where uh, in one syndrome, you have a loss of methylation, so there is a red line below background, and in the other syndrome, you have a gain of methylation, so there's a blue line in Kabuki that is above the background. So perhaps these are the genes that eventually distinguish these uh, these two syndromes on a molecular level. And again, you have, a, you have a region where methylation is acting up or down, as the case may be. All right, so. These are the, you know, high-level themes of how we go about and find what's going on. Now, there are things to be aware of, and I will mention two of those things. So one has to do with cell line heterogeneity. So if you think about it, um, let's say, you know, an analogy is uh, you have people in the room who are like poor students, and uh, then you replace them with rich professors or rich lawyers or whoever. And then you start measuring the wealth of the people in the room. And you discover that uh, people are getting richer. Uh, well, that would be a wrong conclusion. People are not getting richer. You're just replacing poor people with rich people. You kicked out the poor ones. You replace them with totally new ones. But the 
income levels stayed exactly the same for all of them. So the same thing may happen in these DNA methylation studies where you would discover that there's a change in methylation and you say, oh, we have a gain in methylation. No, you didn't have a gain in methylation, you just replaced your cells with the ones that had higher methylation to begin with. So typical example, well, this is again taken from some paper, where in cases you would have these two cell lines and let's pretend that uh, you know, the blue one has low methylation and the red one has higher methylation. So initially uh, the higher methylation was dominant and prevalent and then in the cases you suddenly observe that the level of methylation is lower. So you would then start asking yourself, uh, is it the consequence of the disease? So the disease causes the uh, drop in methylation or is it the opposite? Is it that the drop in methylation causes the disease? Well, none of the above. Uh, all that happened is different populations of cells walked in and, you know, your methylation changes uh, were only due to that. And um, a lot of studies uh, uh, have, to, have to take that into account. Uh, there was a nice paper by uh, two uh, prominent researchers, Jaffa and Irizari, Rafael Irizari, who look at uh, changes in blood composition with age. So they look at uh, various studies and decided that uh, they really have to pay attention to the blood composition because as people age, I'm pointing here, as people age, the amount of different kinds of blood subtypes of cells changes a lot. So eventually you have nothing but granulocytes for the most part. So as you're studying your methylation level, especially between you know, comparing pediatric cohorts to older people, to adults, uh, the apparent changes in methylation are not due to actual gain of methylation or loss of methylation, but primarily due to the replacement of different cell types. So this is one of the confounders that very much has to be accounted for. And there are studies that actually take a kind of deeper look into different sub-cell types. And this is one of them uh, by Rhinus et al which look at specific subtypes of blood and they, you know, they, they, they found various patterns among them and basically they decompose the blood into different profiles and these profiles could be used as references. So the uh, general theme of how we should understand methylation is uh, there could be, let me point this, there could be initial cell types, so think of them as purified cell types, they have certain methylation levels, so here are the profiles of your favorite cell types, and then there are different people who have various combinations of those cell types. You know, these are your patients, your, your controls, your cohorts, and the uh, weighted combination of those cell types, and the weights depend on the person, produce the actual methylation that you then see through the microarrays or through sequencing study or whatever the case may be, unless it's a single cell sequencing where, where things are easier, right? So in general, or up until now, the methylation that we see is typically a result of some kind of weighted combination of profiles and we need to keep track of what those things are. So these profiles could be based on either uh, existing references or you have to discover it through some deconvolution methods that have been uh, produced, such as the one I'm quoting here, reference-free deconvolution method, well, recent enough paper. Um, now, there's evaluation of all these deconvolution methods. So some of them are, uh, right, so this paper studies them if you want to look, you know, take a look. Uh, so th some methods are reference-based. As I mentioned, you first produce your methylation profiles and then you see what your patients and cohorts have in terms of those uh, references. So you find essentially the weights. And there are reference-free profiles of which there are several. So there's uh, quite a few of them and, you know, the number was growing. Uh, the recommended one appar uh, apparently is uh, surrogate value uh, variable analysis package that seems to do well across the board. Some other ones are famous as well. Now, uh, we found it uh, easier sometimes to claim uh, our results through some kind of shortcut. So you can do the full deconvolution and then use your proportions of your cells in your study. That's one way of doing things. Or if the question is simply, is your disease pattern due to cell profiles or not? Is it robust to changes in cell composition or not? You can say uh, the following. You can take all your initial profiles and see if they cluster with controls or not. So here, again, this is from the Nature Communication paper we published some time ago. 
we found a bunch of diseases. We uh, found a bunch of controls. On the PCA, they look like this. So you take your principal component analysis, and uh, diseases are nicely separable from controls. And then you throw together all these individual cell profiles and see if any of them end up with disease. So if any of them end up with disease, you or someone, rather your critic, may claim that, oh, this disease pattern was entirely, or perhaps entirely or in parts, due to that cell type present in the disease population, but not in control population. So your study is confounded, results are garbage, and you know, go, go back and redraw things. Uh, well, in our case, we were, you know, we were good. So our cell subtypes all cluster with controls, and of course, any linear combinations of them will also be there with controls. So you know, that's a, a presentable enough case to say that our disease patterns were actually not dependent on these cell heterogeneity or cell uh, composition effects. And uh, this is not only true for blood. Blood is a complex mixture of all kinds of cells, granulocytes, natural killer cells, you know, all kinds of things. But so is saliva, so is buccal. Buccal is the cheek swabs that people use in all kinds of studies. So you can take a brush and you know, swab someone's cheek uh, tissue, and that would be uh, DNA for analysis. So again, uh, cheek swabs and saliva have uh, heterogeneous mixtures of cells, and you have to be aware of the effects of that. Okay. So another uh, important aspect and technical aspect of all these methylation studies, and not only, is batch effects. So I'll just spend a little bit more time on this. Um, everybody, okay, who has worked with batch effects or has heard of batch effects before? All right, not too many. All right, so uh, typically batch effects is something uh, like this. You have one technician working on Monday and another technician working next Tuesday, and they have different techniques and skills, and, uh, and one of them spits into the sample, just for a good measure. Uh, and the results are different across the technicians, even though your data seems to be the same from the same distribution. So results are uh, dependent on the technical facility, the uh, skills of a person working with the samples, uh, the country in which the samples were processed, the year and date on which it was done, and so on and so forth. So if you do your processing, even in the same facility, uh, in you know January versus July, you may and very well end up with different results. Not only that, if you spread your big cohort across multiple chips, like microarray chips, a chip can only hold that many samples. So 450 array uh, holds 12 samples on a chip. So if you have you know, more than 12 samples, of course, it will be spread across the chips, and different chips can be physically processed in a different way. Right? They are like, handled differently, they are dried differently, and so on and so forth. So what you may discover could be differences due to chip processing, the microarray chip processing, rather than due to the actual disease versus your uh, control study. Uh, so these batch effects are prevalent across lots and lots of studies. And more and more people should be not alarmed, but concerned. And uh, this is an important issue that should not be overlooked. So here's a paper from 2010, where people looked at uh, what was uh, 1,000 genome at the time. So they saw, well, let me see what it is. So across the bottom, the x axis, this is a particular genome location, all right? And the y axis, these are dates on which the chips were processed. So, you know, days are numbered. And what you see here is the coverage, the, the genome coverage. And uh, orange is high and blue is low. So for some reason, you know, there was a, a period of blues where coverage was lower, and then there was a period of highs where coverage was higher, and then periods of lows again. So things very much depended not on anything else, but on the date of processing. So if you happen to have all your diseases processed on blue days and all your controls processed on... Uh, high, you know, orange days, then you will see some differences, perhaps. But they will be due to different dates of processing and maybe different people or different facilities or different other, you know, kinds of things like that uh, on which your analysis depends. And uh, these confounding factors will, well, potentially ruin your study, as we are about to see. So the um, 
uh, normalization doesn't always help. So people say, well, I normalize my data. Well, it's not good enough. So even if you normalize your data, your entire data set, and again, methylation data set can have, as I said, half a million probes or 80, uh, 800,000 probes. So your total methylation profile may very well look well aligned and normalized, but you can have 100 genes that behave like this, where on day one, they're all low methylation, and on day two, they're all high methylation, or expression, or whatever it is you're studying, right? And so, even though uh, overall picture genome-wide seem to be okay, because you did your quantile normalization and things like that, uh, you would still find enough genes with difference, and then you say, oh, these are differentially methylated or differentially expressed genes. Well, no. They were just processed in different ways, and the batch effect was not accounted for, and, you know, things, uh, things should not be published. So, unfortunately. Um, now, there are various ways of correcting batches. So, uh, from simple ones to more complex ones. So, simple ones simply, you know, take the batches, find what were the average levels or something like that, and then try to, you know, equalize them and merge them. Uh, down to oops, down to more complex ways. Uh, so the standard and you know state of the art is called empirical empirical Bayes methods. So typical example is combat function. So combat function has been widely popular, and everybody says we use combat. Don't worry. So combat was used. It corrected uh, for the batch effects and so on. And you know it's a powerful enough function. It was uh, initially published as a standalone R package in 2006. So this is the paper where uh, people announced it, Johnson and Lee. And it was an R package, not even a package, it was like an R function for many years. And then more recently it became a standard part of the surrogate value uh, decomposition package, SVA, surrogate, surrogate value analysis, variable analysis. Right, so now through the SVA package available through R and Bioconductor, you can just have your power of combat with you and you can use it and we'll do that today as well. Now. Uh, main thing to remember is uh, bioinformatics cannot fix bad design. So if your study was poorly designed, a bioinformatician cannot fix it necessarily. It depends. So batch correction may not help, actually. And uh, this is a paper, again, fairly recent. This is March of this year, where, uh, well, the title almost says it all. Where's my mouse? Here. Uh, Adjusting for batch effects in DNA methylation study, a lesson learned. And that was a hard lesson. So as you can imagine, people did something, uh, they realized things are not great, and then they had to redesign uh, the whole, you know, the whole analysis. So the problem here was they were looking at uh, two variants and a reference. So you, you know, reference is in, uh, in, what color is that? Yellow, let's say. And variants are in blue and orange, spread across several chips. So here are seven different microarrays are shown. And as, as I mentioned before, a microarray can hold only 12 samples. The problem was some of these chips, like this one, second one, it only had one reference and two samples from that other variant, but no orange variants. Here, they only had orange variants on chip number four, but no references and no uh, blue variants, and, and so on and so forth. So the problem was that their groups were not equally presented in all batches. So a batch here was defined by a chip, let's say, and not all batches contain equal number of groups, and that became a big problem. So they discovered that, yes, they went through the motion, and after they applied the comeback correction, which they thought will fix all their problems, suddenly they saw a giant spike in the results. So they had tons of differentially methylated regions, and instead of publishing them, they were very smart. They were actually quite alarmed, uh, and went back to study what's going on, and they discovered that all of that was fake. So, um, you know, you can, you can artificially spike your results with false discoveries and then, you know, hopefully you will catch it in time. And uh, another paper, this is a good one, methods that remove batch effects while retaining group differences may lead to exaggerated confidence in downstream analysis. So a good statistical paper, it shows you the mechanics of what can happen. So here's a, uh, the first uh, panel, panel A, in which uh, you would say there are three groups. So, you know, red, blue, and green. And let's just pretend that we try to confound group A with batch 1. So uh, batch 1 only contains this one group, and batch 2 only contains these other groups, but nothing from group 1. And then uh, for some technical reasons, batch 1 may have, you know, slightly higher methylation or slightly higher something, some kind of measure you're studying, gene expression maybe, 
uh, than batch two. So for whatever reason you observe that batch one is different from batch two, you try to correct for that. So you try to centralize them. And of course, everything goes slightly wrong because now batch one goes all the way down to make its center equal to this whole central batch two, right? And therefore your, you know, your, your pink group, your red group drops down below the blue group, for example. And uh, the true values were exactly the same, but now you see artificially introduced differences simply due to the fact that your batch correction failed to correct. So, you know, the batch was bad enough, the correction was applied, and the correction overcorrected. So, problems like that do exist. And uh, we actually saw a number of our collaborators doing this. So, they would confound their study because a technician is not, uh, uh, is not aware of the dangers of batch effects, and they would place all their you know, controls on chip after chip after chip, and then they go to their disease cohort and place them on the sequentially next group of chips. And of course, this is a study, stratified randomization controls better for batch effects. So they did this, in which case the, you know, the uh, uh, case and controls were severely confounded with batch effects with different chips. They found 94,000 differential methylated positions at 5% false discovery rate. So, you know, this was awesome. After combat correction, so combat correction was applied. This is state-of-the-art batch correcting method. And, uh, you know, all of that was garbage. All of that was fake discoveries. So it was not 500, uh, it was not 5% false discoveries. It was 100% false discoveries. So zero uh, remained after the... Uh, uh, after the chips were properly structured, after the design was improved, and after they randomized, or in this case, the, the checkered placement. Right, so the uh, study of another group, same result. So uh, this is a different paper in which, you know, you place all your studies in one batch and all your, uh, you know, other, co other cohort in the other batch, and then you discover things, and then uh, you realize that it was all due to placement in different batches, and unbalanced design of every batch. So long story short, batches should be uh, populated with equal proportions of your groups. So make sure your chips are populated with equal proportions of your groups if you're doing microarrays, or your uh, labs are structured in such a way that you, know, you, uh, you do half of your experiments on Monday and half of your experiments on Tuesday, but it should be a mixture of your groups in, on Monday and also a mixture of your groups on Tuesday so as not to discover that the difference is due to Monday versus Tuesday rather than disease to control. All right? And while we're at it, simply because this paper was available, they said there are two potential perils in cancer studies involving things. So batch effect was number one. And they also discovered that uh, what everybody loves, which is the pathway analysis, uh, that can also go horribly wrong. You can actually discover a lot of uh, interesting enrichments in totally random data. So they took uh, random sets of probes and they discovered uh, enrichment in cancer, enrichment in developmental diseases, enrichments in all kinds of ways. So be aware that some of the pathway analysis software may present issues. So if, you, if you're not careful, you may discover enrichments in pathways that are just always there, cancer uh, uh, development, embryonic development. Um, all right. So I think this is more or less at what I was trying to convey today. So I'll just say that there are you know, luminaries in this world much better than I am, and you can listen to them. Uh, so there are uh, people like Rafael Rizari, who leads a lot of analysis and biostatistical uh, package development. Uh, they know a lot, and they have seen a lot about batch effect and all kinds of issues like that related to DNA methylation, also expression and other types of bioinformatics analysis. So it's worth your time to go through a good selection of lectures on, you know, available on YouTube from Broad Institute, for example. And this is just one of them. This is from 2016, but, you know, it's still there and it's still good. And for about an hour, you can listen to a prominent expert uh, warning you about various pitfalls of your analysis. So it's worth to be aware of all these things. Um, all right. So, to summarize, uh, again, as Guillaume told you in the previous lecture, in the previous module, epigenetics plays a key role in many diseases. So, again, let me hammer down this, uh, this idea that if you're looking for cancer, especially at the stages of progression, 
not the initiation but progression, it's more likely to be due to epigenetic disruptions than anything to do with genetic disruptions. There is also, you know, there is an interplay. You will probably discover some mutations as well, sure, but it's unlikely for you to discover too many driver mutations for your later stages of cancer. So once it's already there, it's progressing through epigenetic dis, uh, uh, dysregulation. Uh, same with any disease that you may think has environmental component. Uh, asthma, uh, uh, allergies, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, so things like that, uh, psoriasis perhaps. Uh, also any disease that has metabolic component, anything to do with your diet, anything to do with diabetes, things of that nature, epigenetic effects are present. Also neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative effects. Uh, you know, the embryonic development is heavily affected by the epigenetic state in, uh, in the womb, in the surrounding placenta, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of factors that are in play beyond simply genetics. So genetics is also there, but epigenetics is very heavily uh, in play. Uh, now, epigenetic machinery is complicated, as I mentioned. So again, not to simplify and make uh, fun of geneticists. They do a wonderful job and there's a lot to do. But epigenetic just has so much more to offer. And, uh, you know, think of uh, like the difference between coding and non-coding genes. So, of course, you know, no one will want to throw away 98% of your genome because it's, you know, what used to be called junk DNA, right? So, like, it's not junk DNA anymore. So, people used to think of, you know, there are genes and there is junk DNA, which is like 98% of your genome. So, like, raise your hand if you want to throw away your junk DNA. I don't. Uh, right? Uh, like, I, I better keep it. And people are realizing in the last, you know, five to ten years, something that, uh, you know, non-coding pieces of your DNA are very, very, very important to your transcriptional machinery and how things are actually progressing. In the same fashion, you can think of epigenetics. Genetics is good. And then, recently, we're discovering more and more that diseases could be caused and, you know, strange phenotypes could be caused by variants in the non-coding part of the genome. You know, non-coding and enhancers, uh, in some other distant locations because, you know, DNA loops in a certain way and, uh, you know, physically close regions could be far away in terms of the genomic coordinates. Same thing with epigenetics. There's a lot going on. Not, you know, not everything is understood far from it. And there's lots and lots of different agents acting upon the DNA. So there's, uh, you know, DNA methylation. There are all various uh, histone modifications of which there are too many. And their combinations are uh, affecting transcriptions and eventually translation and so on. Then there are uh, all these issues related to uh, transcription factor binding sites. So some binding sites could be physically blocked by all these marks and some other binding sites are open. And so the tr transcriptional machinery can or cannot access them. Uh, so there are too many of these agents acting. And for us, the bioinformatician, that presents a um, kind of combinatorial challenge. There are too many things, meaning there are now multiple data types, multiple data formats, multiple sources from which these data pieces could be, uh, could be fished out from ENCODE, from ICAC, from GO, from all kinds of other places. They're all in different formats, which means also you have to develop multiple pipelines or think how to put all these multi-omic things together and make sure all the formats match and, you know, the methods apply and so on. And statistics is there as well. And of course, the you know, next big thing, machine learning, everybody's doing it. So, you know, uh, lots of things will be probably uh, explosively developed in this area, simply because the area is complicated and lots of things is going on. And this will probably be enough for us to do for many decades to come. Um, all right. So on the technical level, those are, you know, nice um, motivational things, but beware of certain technicalities. So beware of confounders such as cell heterogeneity. As I mentioned, your results could be almost entirely or to some extent due to the fact that you forgot that the cells are not a uniform mixture. It could be a heterogeneous mixture and marks such as DNA methylation act as an averaging agent. So unless you're doing a single cell analysis, you, uh, you have to be aware of the complexities of your actual DNA population. And also be aware of batch effect that applies well beyond epigenetics, you can, you know, you can think of batch effects applicable to almost every area of quantitative studies in biochemistry and so on. So gene expression is no, you know, not averse to batch effects. And of course, DNA methylation, histone modification, and so on, could be very much impacted by 
batches and just be aware of how you design your study because if you spend your uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars on a study and then all of that is wrong bioinformatics student cannot fix it for you in two weeks so you will have to go back and redesign your whole study and pay the money again unfortunately uh, okay so on this very positive note thank you very much <laughs> And uh, right, so I'll just mention that I am from Sick Kids. I'm uh, from uh, Center for Computational Medicine. Uh, Michael Brudner, who presented yesterday, is leader of the center, and we have a big and nice team. Sergey is sitting there. Uh, and also, I work with Rosanna Wexberg Lab. Uh, maybe some of you know her, for, uh, and some clinical geneticists at Sick Kids as well. So we do some interesting studies on developmental diseases and so on. Uh, thank you.